Okay, so um, today I wanted to begin by talking a bit about the metta sutta. So we're getting into this practice of social metta, and it seemed like a good place to start is by going back to the roots. You know, where does this practice come from? Uh, it comes from the early Buddhist tradition. Um, there's one text in particular that um, I'd love to look at with you all today, which is called the Metta Sutta. Um, sutta just means um, that it's uh, um, the Buddha's words. Um, so, uh, you know, according to legend, <laughs> it's that the Buddha said these things. Um, we don't really fully know. There's some good scholarship on that. I'm not a Buddhist scholar. I'm just a Buddhist geek. Um, but uh, if you're interested, you can you can dive deep into that. Um, that said, I did find a really interesting and helpful link here to 20 different translations of the Metta Sutta, and I'd like to share that with you all. Um, so it's in the chat now. This is from a, a teacher who put this together named Lee Brasington, uh, who's an excellent uh, concentration teacher, Dharma teacher. And um, here you can see that there's I mean, obviously quite a number of different translations of what is essentially a very short text. And I like um, to share a little bit about the context of the story, the legend behind the text, because it's kind of funny and interesting. So there's apparently a group of monks um, who went out into the woods to meditate, like in the deep woods, you know, to get some like solo retreat time, essentially. And they went out together to support each other. And when they got into the woods, they started experiencing all kinds of weird stuff, like kind of like they were haunted by the spirit uh, spirits of the woods who like clearly were not happy with them being there and like getting into getting into their stuff. So they got freaked out, got scared, ran away from the woods you know, and came back to the Buddha and said, hey, look, we tried to go put uh, these practices, the mindfulness, concentration uh, liberation. We tried to go do that in the woods and wake up, but we couldn't because we were haunted and scared away by these ghosts, <laughs> essentially. And so the Buddha says, okay, well, uh, let me share with you uh, this teaching. And, and if you have a, a heart filled with loving kindness, universal friendliness, uh, then you'll be fine. You can go back into the woods and they'll love you and they'll take care of you and they'll become your friends these these spirits of the woods and so he does he teaches this uh these teachings the trend uh, the metta sutta and they take this practice and this kind of pointer and they go back out to the woods and they make friends with the, the wood spirits and the ghosts and everything it is copacetic um so that's interesting you know it's just it's kind of interesting just to notice the the mythological backdrop of the practice and the cultural setting um, of course, in our secular rational society, which is mostly what we have in modern society, we don't typically think in these terms. Um, though I'd say if you ever are haunted uh, or if you have, so you're experiencing weird things, try this out. Try doing metta. <laughs> you know, just in case, last case resort, you know. <laughs> um, and then, you know, here in these different translations, you'll see there's there's lots of different translations. I want to share the last one from what's called the Chenrezig Project, um, because I found this is really a nice translation, and it translates the phrase that we're going to be using, may all beings be happy, yeah, as may all beings be happy. Um, there, as you can see, this one phrase, uh, which is the only phrase and it's the only part in the text where there's this aspirational phrase that's offered which is the kind of uh, how we're linking this contemporary practice with this ancient text and tradition um, that there's different ways that that's translated um, may they be secure and profoundly well may all beings be happy in themselves may all beings be at ease may beings all live happily and safe and may their hearts rejoice within themselves. Let all creatures indeed be happy and secure. Let them be happy minded. These are some of the different translations. You can see them for yourself as you go through the text. Um, may all beings be happy. This one just is really simple and it ties into a, a future practice we want to introduce. So this is our kind of connection point. So that's the reason I'm using uh, this translation, the Chenrezig project. And um, here, I'd just like to read 
read the text briefly. So if you imagine the Buddha sharing these words on loving kindness, this is his pointing out instructions to the monks that are still freaking out from their encounter in the woods, being scared of the woods. He says, this is the work for those who are skilled and peaceful, who seek the good. May they be able and upright, straightforward, of gentle speech, and not proud. May they be content and easily supported, unburdened with their senses calmed. May they be wise, not arrogant, and without desire for the possessions of others. May they do nothing mean or that the wise would reprove. That's a high bar. May all beings be happy. May they live in safety and joy. All living beings, whether weak or strong, tall, stout, medium, or short, seen or unseen, near or distant, born or to be born, may they all be happy. Let no one deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none by anger or hatred wish harm to another. As a mother watches over her child, willing to risk her own life to protect her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings, suffusing the whole world with unobstructed loving kindness. Standing or walking, sitting or lying down during all one's waking hours, may one remain mindful of this heart and this way of living that is the best in the world. Unattached to speculations, views, and sense desires with clear vision, such a person will never be reborn in the cycles of suffering. So, as you can tell, I mean, just listening to the text, it's so clear and direct considering this is 25 plus 100 years old. Uh, obviously, this is a translation, but um, it's really a beautiful one, I think. And um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the things that st stand out to me when I look at this text and when I work with these practices. Um, one is the, ideal, the idealization of uh that, that that that's involved here and i think one of the things i both love and hate about the early buddhist tradition is the way that wisdom is is um is discussed and the ideal of the of the enlightened uh one is both beautiful in its aspiration like amazing inspiring at times and is also like completely unachievable <laughs> <laughs> by uh, anyone that I've ever met. <laughs> um, and so I think when we hold those ideals in some kind of strict, rigid way of thinking like I, I or others should actually behave like this or be like this all the time, then it's a certain kind of violence that we do to ourselves and others. It's a certain kind of um, puritanism that's unhelpful. Um, but when it's held as a kind of aspiration or as a kind of... Um, you know, a, a GPS coordinates to, to, to incline toward. Um, I think it can be a really beautiful aspiration um, if we don't, you know, beat ourselves up too hard for not being perfect. So that's one thing that comes to mind here. <laughs> May they do nothing mean or that the wise would reprove. It's like, okay, I don't know that I've had a single day of my life where I've done nothing mean. <laughs> um, maybe. Um, the other thing that come, that really sticks out for me is the emphasis on all living beings and the way that that's really um, drawn out in the text, you know, whether they're weak or strong, tall, stout, medium or short, no matter the characteristics of the being, no matter who, no matter what describes that being, uh, they're included in this wish, this universal wish for, for well-being. Uh, and, and interestingly, in the Buddhist psychology, they, they don't even necessarily just include beings that are alive. I mean, it's like, it's not just all beings throughout space, but it's also all beings throughout time, um, including those that have yet to be born. Um, 
including those that we see and those that we don't, those that are near, those that are local, those that are not local. Um, and, you know, just that sort of emphasis on there being no quality or characteristic that would exclude one uh, from this loving kindness points to the universal nature of the loving kindness of the loving awareness that we're cultivating and getting in touch with in these practices. And this is pretty radical and pretty profound. Uh, even now, um, it was 2,500 years ago to, <laughs> um, to extend these religious practices to include all beings, not just all beings who are in my group. Um, that's quite a break actually. And um, a precursor in a lot of ways to later philosophies that would come about, um, maybe inspiration for them too. You've got that beautiful phrase, suffusing the whole world with unobstructed loving kindness. Um, this phrase, I think um, it's beautiful, Andrew, you pointed out in the first week you know, that, that meta practice can be done in a couple different ways. You can do work really a lot with phrases and kind of directing phrases to, to particular categories or beings, uh, which we'll do a lot of here. Um, but you can also radiate the feeling of metta or loving kindness or compassion or empathy or whatever. Uh, you can radiate it out in all directions, suffusing the whole world with loving kindness. And that whole world part is the universal part. Um, here, the contemporary teacher, Reggie Ray, speaks about it this way. He says, the universe is a vast ocean of life. And we love in a way that is infinite and unconditional, everything that is. Um, so this is to me what the universal means, is that it's true everywhere, throughout all space and time. There's nowhere and no when in which this isn't true. That's a universal truth. Um, and so this universal teaching on loving kindness is, is, is pointing toward that, um, you know, in my experience toward, toward the type of heart that can include everything. Standing or walking, sitting or lying down during all one's waking hours, may one remain mindful of this heart. Um, so I think here, we've got this emphasis on the constant continuity of practice of mindful awareness uh, being brought to bear in the same way with this practice, um, which makes you wonder, are these different practices since <laughs> one is supposed to do this all the time? <laughs> I mean, it seems like there's just one practice to me, which is interesting. Um, although some people will try to say that metta is different from Vipassana is different from, yeah. And that's true too. Yeah. Um, so those are some of the things that kind of, um, came to mind there. And, and then the last phrase, you know, unattached to speculation, views, sense, desires with clear vision, such a person will never be reborn in the cycles of suffering. This is actually pretty profound because in the traditional Buddhist metaphysics to not be reborn actually indicates that one has achieved already a very high degree of realization. Um, to not be reborn, one must have already, according to tradition, experienced the third stage of four of enlightenment, um, the non-returner, as, as they're called, um, the anagami. And so what, what to me is being pointed here, and this is pretty profound, is that um, such a person who is abiding in such an open heart is awake, and that that abiding in the open heart is the same as as awakening. Um, and so uh, I remember being at Spirit Rock on a long retreat. Someone asked Jack Cornfield, they said, you know, th this, this basic question is metta practice different than Vipassana practice? Uh, my understanding, you know, from all the teachers I've worked with, they said is that it's a relative practice. It doesn't lead you to enlightenment. Uh, is that true <laughs> to Jack? And Jack said, well, if love doesn't bring one to enlightenment or to wake one up, like what will? <laughs> so, um, 
so here I'm not going to, to, to make these kind of distinctions where I say this practice doesn't lead to awakening. This practice does because it's an ultimate practice. No, they're all, all of the different ways to meditate are ultimate practices when we bring them to the, to the, to their completion.